Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Radical Candor Podcast. I'm Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. And I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the Radical Candor Podcast. We're missing someone today. Jason, who could it be? Kim is swimming with the fishes. I mean, the dolphins. (laughs) The dolphins. By the way, I once swam with a dolphin. I swam with Keke Malu, who was a wolfin, which was a mix of a killer whale and a dolphin. And we do like to laugh on this podcast when we think something is funny. And something is often very funny on this podcast. But often, laughter doesn't have anything to do with hilarity. In fact, in the absence of an underlying medical condition, laughing can be a stress response, a way for people to regulate their emotions, and avoid being overcome with anxiety. We have a question today from a listener about this topic, and this person writes, quote, how do I coach people with nervous laughter habits? I evangelize radical candor at work heavily, but I struggle with this one. How do I tell people, you laugh too much and too loud, and it's annoying, and it's holding you back in your career? That was the question this person wants to to, to ask, yeah. Uh, and and they, they continue, I'm guessing the answer will be something similar to that, but as much as I preach, I'm stuck. I've read that people with nervous laughter can get worse the more they think about it. How do you tell someone to stop laughing? Help, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> there was an exclamation point. And Jason, you're laughing, and I'm wondering, what kind of laughing are you laughing? Like, can we I, self-diagnose? I, I think it is... I, I'm laughing at the his, how funny it is to think about telling someone to stop laughing. And also, I, I think I just appreciated the sincerity of the help at the end of that note. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm laughing because I have been in positions like that before. And it's just sort of funny to think how the human condition can drive us to these moments where we're like, in the abstract, like, why on earth would I tell someone to stop laughing? Like, it seems like such an innocent thing. But I, I can see why a habit of nervous laughter, especially it's at an early stage in someone's career where they're building reputation with people, could actually get in the way of their success. Yeah. I, I think first, starting from the assumption that the person is not actually aware of what's going on is very helpful. Mm-hmm. So just that framing, like, starting stating that as an assumption is, is quite helpful. And and I think if I was, if we, if we think about how we might go about approaching this person, I think back to Kim's um story, and I, I think I, my the approach that I would recommend is the same one that Cheryl took at the in the first round of the story, which is like, hey, you laughed a lot in that meeting we were in just now. Yeah. At, hey, because, did you know you laughed a lot in that meeting? Yeah. Cor- correct. I, I think that's exactly the place that that I would start, and the the reason why is like you don't know. Maybe the person is painfully aware of it and Mm -hmm. they're really struggling with managing it. They might be unaware Mm -hmm. that it is happening or the the impact that it's having. And so creating some space for the other to to say, to say, hey, I became aware of this. Are you aware of it? Um, is really helpful. And the reason because like by doing that, there's an acknowledgement that it might actually be subconscious. Like the the person may not be in control of the behavior. Yeah, and we're gonna unpack that. A little bit. Before we do, Jason, I'm curious, have you ever had an experience where you felt like you were having an, I don't know if it's an episode of nervous laughter or using laughter as a way to regulate emotions? Uh, I sometimes laugh when people cry. And not because I'm uncomfortable with crying necessarily. I don't cry often. And so I think I sometimes have my initial reaction is, is uncertainty. And then that as comes out as sort of nervous laughter. As you say that, like, how is that feeling for you as you're aware that you have that reaction? Oh, I'm, a, I'm aware of it. And it gets me into trouble, not infrequently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that laughter w- was actually thinking back on how humorous it is, the trouble that it has got me into. I think what I've learned about my own nervous, uh, my own tendency toward nervous laughter in certain situations it, it's like my brain giving me a, a pause to like, it's inserting something into the space where I'm like processing an emotion. That's usually where nervous laughter comes up for me. Jason, to your point about having what we might call uh, an expression, an emotion that's incongruous, dimorphous. Uh, so let me mm. just 
backpedal on this. There is a professor of psychology at Yale University, co-author of the study, which we will put in the show notes, Dimorphous Expressions of Positive Emotion. This is Margaret Clark. And Professor Clark says, quote, we call the experience of a single emotion which gives rise to an expression normatively consistent with a different emotion incongruous or dimorphous expressions of emotion. So, for example, this would be crying tears of joy at a wedding or laughing at a funeral. Jason, maybe it's what you were talking about where someone is crying and you give yourself that pause through laughing. Yeah, I don't know if I'm giving it to myself. <laughs> I feel like this is a place where my subconscious hijacks my whole body. So mm-hmm. I, I I don't think this is like a thing that I'm like, oh, you know, it would be helpful. This is right a now. really good. <laughs> hey, Jason, knock, this is a really good time. Throw in a little laugh. Well, Although, I will say. Oh, I, go ahead. I was going to say I often cry tears of sadness at weddings and laugh joyously at funerals. I, it, dep- it really depends on the. Wait, wait, what? It depends on who's getting married and and what's happening at the funeral. We had a a situation at my grandmother's funeral where she had asked, one one of the things that she had asked is like for the priest who had uh, overseen her religious journey for many years to um, read at, at her funeral. And at this point, the priest was so old that like everyone in the audience had a collective concern that some, that the priest was not going to make it to the end of the, the funeral. And there are several moments where the confrontation with like the mortality, like thinking of our dead grandmother asking this priest to like come out of retirement to like speak at her funeral, the precipitous or, or sort of like the dangerous nature uh, uh, of that, given the frail, uh, his frail condition, uh, gave us like a, a moment uh, of, I, I don't think it was just nervous laughter, of like actual, uh, uh, of actual like a feeling of, release of like, oh, like, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody's living with mortality. So anyway, I I think like... No, but I think that's a really important... Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why Shakespeare had like comic relief. Like, and it's a way to... It doesn't have to be dimorphous, I guess is what I'm saying. I think you Mm -hmm. can have laughter at a funeral that's not dimorphous, where there's actual something happy happening at a funeral. Yeah. I don't know if I had... I wouldn't call it happy, but I had an experience where a very dear friend and her daughter, uh, it was a very tragic car accident on Christmas and they were both killed. And it was such a huge tragedy. Um, and it's one of those stories you're like, oh, that, you know, never happens. Um, to, and, and, but of course it does. And I was at the funeral sitting next to another close friend and something happened during the ceremony that we both were aware that our dear friend would have found hilarious. And yes. so we act, and she had such a joy for life and such a beautiful sense of humor. And so the two of us started laughing, like in yeah. celebration of this person. Yeah. And of course, there was a person, older woman in front of us who was very devout and turned around in a very scolding way, which yes. then we, of course, knew that she also would have found hilarious. Um, <laughs> so that so, probably made it very hard to stop yeah, laughing. Yeah. So, but it was like, there was something, it wasn't just like the emotional, really, it was really like an honoring of this person's spirit and juxtaposed with the solemnity of the moment, um, yes. which for me is actually an even deeper form of like just that fine line between laughter and tears. Yeah. I, and I, I, I think the point of the, uh, of the article is like, you are feeling sadness and you start to laugh. That that's the dimorphous expression mm-hmm. that they're referring to mm-hmm. in the article is, is is like internal. It's not society. It's not like what society judges to be appropriate. It's actually about what's happening internally to you. So you're aware that you feel sadness, and what comes out is laughter. Or you're aware that you feel joy, and what comes out are tears. Although I think that's probably slightly different because I I feel like t- tears. I, I mean, maybe laughter is just as uncontrollable as tears. Maybe that's a, me being judgmental. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel we had that we had that episode um, where we did talk about emotions and you know our laughter is laughter okay versus tears. There was a piece yep. in Headspace, and we'll go ahead and put that in the show notes. And I'm just going to quote 
It says, Clark and her colleague, again, this is Margaret Clark from Yale, Clark and her colleague's study suggests that when we experience extremely high or low emotions, such as deep sadness or escalating uneasiness, we can feel physiologically overwhelmed and have difficulty functioning, approaching an unmanageable emotional limit. And so emotional homeostasis or, or balance allows us to better control our cognitive, social, and psychological functions. And laughter serves as one mechanism that can help regulate our emotional state. And of course, it also activates the endorphin system in the brain. So, you know, from, from this, it feels like there is an element of our bodies are processing and trying to get to balance homeostasis. In some ways, I, I feel like they're the, what's at least implied here is that it's not actually that dissimilar from you burning yourself and you pulling your hand back, like that automatic mm-hmm. re- unconscious reaction to right the situation, right? <laughs> to, to like, you, you do something without thinking about it. And the argument they're making is that laughter performs that function in cases where we're feeling really overwhelmed. And I think it's helpful to understand that because, you know, Kim always makes the point about radical candor focusing on things that we can control like behavior or work product. And so having sort of a wide sense of, is this something that we can maybe not control, maybe manage, maybe some of it we might not be able to, to manage. And I think, so sort of thing one would be, how can we understand the person who might be experiencing this, that, that nervous laughter is a defense mechanism to help keep people from feeling anxious or overwhelmed. It can also become a habit Uh, that Mm -hmm. the person doesn't even notice. And it can be misperceived by others as as being obnoxious, inappropriate, or even mean. And so I thought it would be- The person in your story, the woman in front of you was probably perceiving it as an insult, like that somehow your behavior was insulting. Yeah, Correct. And um, Brandy tracked down a blog from an executive coach, Andrea Holland, who detailed how her own nervous laughter actually almost derailed an internship opportunity. Jason, would you like to play this one out or would you like me to try it? I'll give it, I'll give it a shot. I, I feel okay. like my acting bona fide, I, I'm much better as, as an improviser. So let's see how I do in a stage okay. read. Okay. I'm a junior in college. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm studying that felt, communication. That felt, that felt really, can you take it I'm from studying. the top? Maybe a, like a, yeah, I'm studying yeah. communication. I hope to work with your team as an intern. <laughs> No, I don't have any direct marketing experience, but I'm willing to learn. (laughs) (laughs) Suddenly, the woman interviewing me sternly says, I don't like your nervous laugh. It makes me not trust you. Remember that. Ouch. So rude. So rude, um, Andrea Holland writes. My nervous laughter tick almost destroyed that internship opportunity. How did it feel saying that? It seems like you actually had a good time. I thought it it was fun. I mean, look, laughing is is great. Um, it, it's super fun. I could see why our, our bodies want to do it, even when it may not be socially appropriate. Yeah. But also I could see, like, if you're really unaware of it, I could see what, like it, why it would be sh- shocking. But I think I, I'm often aware that I'm laughing in a way that is contextually inappropriate. Like when it's happening to me, I'm aware that it's happening, even though I'm not necessarily in control. Right, like the the act is happening at a subconscious level, but I am consciously aware that it is weird that I am laughing right now. <laughs> that that is like a a thing that happens to me. So, if someone called me out on it, I would be like, I, I might appreciate the opportunity to explain that that it was a tick, and I wasn't actually like it wasn't intent. It was it wasn't my intent to. Mm-hmm. Seem has that like ever I'm happened that it. someone has said, Jason, I just shared something really upsetting, and you're laughing. Yes. I won't get into the particulars of it because it's a, person, a personal story, but Jillian, my, my wife, has, has called me on it more, more than one time. She's like, you're smirking. This isn't funny. And I'll be like, well, I you're laughing even... as you say it. So like, do you... it, it's, it's funny to me because it's one of those things like I wasn't smirking because I was like, in, I wasn't having a thought. This is, just, this is really funny. You know what I mean? It's one, it's one of those moments where it's a, there's a disconnect between what you are thinking or maybe even trying to do and what your body is like allowing you to, to do in that moment. Uh, and it's funny in retrospect because 
I'm, I'm often appreciative, like in this particular example, we were having a disagreement and I was appreciative because I said, no, I'm, I'm like, I, I take this very seriously. Like I'm, I'm not trying to, I'll try to stop myself from snickering. Um, because I, I, I don't find this, uh, I don't find this funny. Uh, and that was, I mean, it was great to put the conversation back on track. It really, it literally took five seconds in the conversation to, to get it to write itself with her bringing awareness to it. And I'm glad she said something as opposed to harboring a feeling that I had belittled her. First of all, thank you for sharing that. What I was curious about as you were sharing was that it feels to me like your brain has this ability to hold multiple things at one time. So you can hold both the empathy, the care, the deep love for Jillian and not wanting to intentionally cause harm. At the same time, there is some part of you that is kind of just in a meta way, marveling at the sort of ridiculousness of human behavior that your body is doing something different from what you want to do. So like, that's very interesting because my tendency would be to be more, I wouldn't laugh. I would probably go more on the um, tears. You know, if it was something that was really important, I would feel more sad that I had, you know, hurt someone I cared about unintentionally. And I wouldn't be sort of having a, kind of metaphysical awareness of like, oh, the foibles of human communication, which it sounds like is was some of what was happening for you. Yeah, I think it's more like the foibles of human existence. You know, we don't, <laughs> we, 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 like Jillian, you know, um, lives with a chronic illness. Her body does things that betray her all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like she, she's like tries, to, and I think when you live with someone um, who has, any kind of chronic medical condition, you realize that there are things that our bodies do, that our bodies and our minds do, whether it's chronic physical or, or mental condition, that our bodies and minds do, that we're just like not in control of. And, and uh, I saw a post on on Instagram over the weekend. It was like, I don't know if it was a screenshot of a Twitter thing or whatever, but it was a long text post. And the text basically said, I have come to appreciate thinking of myself as my own zookeeper. And, and somehow it makes it more manageable instead of saying, you know, Jason, you're being really irritable right now. It somehow makes it more manageable to think the conditions in the tiger's environment are making it really hard for him to maintain his cool. <laughs> like that, that framing of the of yeah. like seeing yourself as sort of like as a creature in a context, like made mm-hmm. it easier for this person to like imagine ways of managing themselves. And I think like that even when I'm not at my best, I think Jillian and I actually play pretty good foils to each other to remind ourselves like, Hey, we're not like fully in control here. So we might, might as well like appreciate both what is happening and try to like make amends for the harm that we cause in the moment, but also appreciate that like some of that may be subconscious or unconscious. Um, and we may, we may not be driving <laughs> we may not be be fully we in control may be in of the, the vehicle zoo, but not the full zookeeper you know one of the things one of the modalities that has gotten quite popular in recent years internal family systems and this sort of viewing of different parts uh that we bring to bear and so this won't be a a therapy session but we did have a separate email conversation about how sometimes you know is the role of a manager therapist. And we came back with a resounding no, the manager is not a therapist and a therapist has clear skills. And maybe sometime we will get Jillian on the podcast who could share, yeah. share that perspective. But I think it's important to bring that lens in because if, if this is a behavior that cannot necessarily be consciously controlled, it might be able to be managed. But how do you think, Jason, that awareness as whether your colleague, you know, peer manager, if somebody does have the email that was sent in, the executive coach that that does have this nervous laughter tick, like how does that framing help someone develop a little more empathy for the person experiencing it? I thought it was instructive in the piece from Andrea Holland that there was even the ouch so rude, but there was a playfulness of like, oh, mm. you know, my nervous laughter tick almost destroyed that. So it was actually, I think, appreciative of that person. I thought it would be helpful before we go further to bring Kim Scott into this conversation. And there's a blog post where she 
writes about how to be radically candid about BO, mm. body odor. Jason, do you know what I'm talking about? I do. I remember this blog post. And Kim, if I may quote, she's referring to Mrs. Money Penny because she writes, Mrs. Money Penny has a lot to teach us about getting creative when handling this delicate issue. Mrs. Money Penny came up with an ingenious solution. She bought an employee with BO a white Sea Island cotton shirt and warned him that excessive perspiration would ruin it. In this context, she asked him which antiperspirant he used, and he explained to her that he used deodorant, but not antiperspirant. She suggested he start using both. He did. And the problem was solved. Well, just if you're wondering, wait, what? Kim does go on to say some people when reading this story will condemn the purchase of the white shirt, saying they'd prefer a boss who just told them plainly. Kim feels like this was an act of kindness. Um, And she quotes these inimitable lines, if I may quote her, while some people would prefer a boss who'd just come out and tell them if they stank, others wouldn't. (laughs) And and, and I think she she goes further, right, that the onus is on the boss to adapt to saying things in a way that it's easiest for the employee to hear as opposed to the easiest for them to say. Clarity and kindness get measured at the listener's ear, not the speaker's mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the reason why this one is interesting, because she goes on to say, by buying the shirt, Mrs. Moneypenny showed she cared by being brave enough to ask her employee, which Annie Persprint he used. She was challenging directly. She was raising a difficult issue to talk about directly. And so Kim, at least in the blog post, put the way that she handled the situation in the, in the radical candor quadrant, she'd call it deft, D-E-F-T, deft candor. Uh, and so candor could be delicate. Um, and so I don't know, Jason, how, how would you want to be told? I mean, granted you're alone in a, in your own office and you've talked about sweating a lot lately with all the trials and travails of the home repairs, but how would you want someone to tell you about this sticky issue? I'm the kind of person that if I like know you really well, I'll be like, Hey, do I stink? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, so I I feel like I'm already aware enough of the potential for, for body odor, um, that like, I, I feel like I would probably nip it in the butt, but I feel like if I was unaware of it, I am not self-conscious enough. It's not like an issue that I'm self-conscious enough about, or I would be offended if someone was like, Hey man, put on some deodorant. I would Um, be horrified. Like, oh, and I, I think this is an example of something where yeah. you're sort of walking around the world feeling like someone would have told you if you had this issue. And then if you found out like, you know, decades later that you've been walking around like with bad breath or stinky, like yeah. be horrible. Randy, can I bring you in on this? Where do you, where do you land on this topic? Oh gosh. About how someone can tell you that you smelled? Yeah. Yeah. Got some BO. I would want it to be more like kind, you know, Mm. somebody to say like, hey, I'm not sure if you're aware, but kind of hot in here, like versus someone just coming up and be like, oh, you stink. Because that to me feels like bullying, like just from being bullied in middle school, not about stinking, but just any kind of direct making fun of me is really challenging for me. Uh, to not internalize and take personally. And then I'm a, think you're a terrible person forever. But I do feel like one (laughs) of the things Kim mentioned was that, you know, the shirt could be perceived as manipulative insincerity, but she felt like it wasn't manipulative insincerity because she really was trying to do something healthful. Um, But I'm curious, like you said, oh, you know, is it hot in here? But that's still kind of dancing around it a little bit. What specifically would you want them to say? You know what? I don't know. I will tell you that I had also this experience with an employee once and there was an odor and I, this was a reporter who was going into people's homes, into the community. And I felt like I was going to have to have a conversation about what was going on. So I actually just said, is everything okay? And the person ended up telling me that um, if you're from New England, you know that you have to buy heating oil, which can be very expensive. And then if you run out, there's a whole thing about they have to like do something to the line and there's another fee. Anyways, they didn't have any heating oil and it was the middle of winter. So they were not able to bathe or wash any of their clothes. Mm. So that immediately like 
I was able to approach things with more compassion and like, how can I help? What do you need? And they ended up getting their oil. Like I ended up not having to say anything uh, because they resolved the problem. I've dealt with this a few times over the course of my career, especially with like younger people. I will say it's been a bias for males. Like there have been younger males who have who I've worked with who have come to the office. And a couple of times, like my approach was not entire more direct than what was in the than what Mrs. Moneypenny <laughs> did, but more like, hey, I've noticed. Um, that there's like a bit of an order and I want to talk to you like about possibility of like antiperspirant or deodorant, something similar to that conversation because I'm mm-hmm. like, what this person knows? Like, I think it'd be very di- I have never been in, in faced with a situation where it's like a much older person, for example, who, who like theoretically like would have learned things about hygiene and may, may have something else going on. So I don't know what I would have done in those situations. So I wound up on the more direct side of things, more like a, like an older brother type of conversation as opposed to like a boss mm-hmm. type of conversation. Um, I, well, I think, and I think it's interesting you say that they were also men because I wonder if it was a woman or, you know, non-binary person, like how that might impact that conversation. From yes. Your, like, I, I wonder would if you have like, felt as comfortable doing it that way. May, maybe not. Like I might have asked someone mm-hmm. else to, to approach uh, someone of a different gender, just because I, I do think that there's a, like, there's a difference between subconscious behavior and like a sort of more binary situation of like doing or not doing something for like Mm -hmm. hygiene. I, I, and the reason why that's on my mind is like, I think the BO thing is it, it might be a more uncomfortable initial conversation, but there, it's like a solvable problem. Uh, whereas the, the laughter thing may not actually like, There may not be an obvious solution to it. Um, So it might be, in some ways, it might be easier. I mean, I also think people are, generally speaking, less sensitive to about maybe like slightly awkward social things than they are about their physical bodies. Like, I think like. Yeah, I think I would be more comfortable hearing about nervous laughter laughter than than about mm -hmm. you stink. Like that (laughs) would just cut me to the core. Or it's also people. So this was a problem when I was a kid. And then I feel like it skipped a generation and now it's back is people saying like every other word. And it's almost unlistenable some of times because it, everything is like, well, then he said this, but like, I didn't mean that. And then like, she did this and like, what are you talking about? And like I said, and so it was very direct telling us when I was a kid, we actually had to like write our name on the board and got in trouble if we said like in an incorrect way in sixth grade. I think there was even like a Family Ties episode it, about it where Jennifer, it, like, it was, it, a, it it was, was a cool as though crowd. there was a rule against using the word like in an As, as if and as though. In an I incorrect so manner. Can we bring in Kim Scott's spirit to this? What would Kim say about somebody, whatever generation, with a, would, would this be considered the same thing as? Um, is is like the same thing as Kim's um story. I think she would she would say absolutely absolutely yes. It's a verbal tick in the same way. The what's interesting is that some languages don't have filler words and then people don't use them. So there there's actually a connection between our language like the structure mm-hmm. like the structure of our language and the use of filler words and in other languages like I think Japanese, the filler word is ano. So it's like ano. That's how you would pause in the middle of a sentence. I'm doing a lot and, of nodding, just intentionally trying not to say like or um, well, I'm listening <laughs> to you. And also to and not so, nervously laugh. And so I, I think there's a, there's a point at which it becomes distracting. And Brandy, I think that's your, your point, which is that using filler words is not in an absolute sense a problem. But when the filler words wind up interrupting the clarity or understandability of what it is that you're saying, then it can become really difficult. And and I think that the way that I look at this is the language we choose is a user interface to our thoughts. And we can try to say that, hey, it's just a generational thing and that's just how they talk and other people should adapt. But 
I, I tend to be of the point of view that we are in control for the, uh, again, barring a medical issue of some kind, we're in control of what we say, right? Of how we communicate things. And if our goal is to be best understood by as many people as possible, we should be thoughtful about how we choose to say those things. Given, given the, the, the simplicity of both the behavior of nervous laughter and using a filler word like, like, or um, <laughs> using it correctly, uh, <laughs> I think it's it's as simple as, as saying, "Hey, I noticed that you said the word like a lot in there. Were you aware of that?" Mm-hmm. And, and would you say the same thing for the nervous laughter? I think so. I mean, going back, to, I I think that's the the place that I would start before I got into impact. I would start with like with a question about how the person perceived it themselves. Like, were they aware of it? Was it something that mattered to them? Where I would say that there's a difference between where we are today and maybe where you were, Brandy, in, in school where you're being forced to write your name on the board, I don't think it's necessary to punish people for doing the wrong thing here. I right. think there are, it was there are Catholic some natural... <laughs> Punitive I mean, by nature. Spare the rod. Spoil the child. Spoil the child. But there are some natural consequences. And so I, I think step two, if someone came back to me and said, oh yeah, it's a verbal tick. It doesn't really matter. I would be curious to say, do you, how do you do you know for sure that it doesn't matter? It doesn't impact the way that that people hear what it is that you're trying to say. Have you ever asked anybody else? I I think I would continue an inquiry before I got to my perspective because I think one of the challenges with the question as it's posed at the beginning of of this thing uh, of you laugh too the much. How do you? How yeah. do I tell people you laugh too much and too loud, and it's annoying and it's holding you back in your career? Correct. So this person is judgmental about. Like they've they've decided that it's bad. They've mm-hmm. decided that it's bad, and and I, I think what they mean to say is it annoys me, and, and I think that that's okay. But if you're the mm-hmm. boss, I think it's important not to jump immediately to this behavior, which may be su- happening at the subconscious level, is annoying. So it's useful to have more than like sort of a few steps between raising awareness and sharing your own perspective or the concern that you have that it could impact the, their growth because many people, when made aware of it, might be open to tips for how to reduce it without ever getting to, I find the, like, I find you very annoying <laughs> when, you, when you do mm-hmm. this. I'm pausing because Brandy, it looked like you had something you well, wanted to say. Well, I was just going to say, just... yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it. Tell the person I find it annoying. There is somebody in my building who has a visitor often who I call the laugher. And this person laughs after every single thing they say. And you can hear it through the whole building. It's like, ha, 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 ha. And I find it so annoying. This person doesn't work for me. I don't know them. I don't need to give them the feedback. But I think some examples of, you know, when you're doing the questioning, like examples of how cold you back, like in a job interview, in a presentation, um, when you're negotiating with clients, it can make you be seen taken less seriously. Yep. And I think that's the general impact is that it, you get taken less seriously. I think the more specific impact, especially of laughter, is it's hard to tell if you take what you just said seriously. Right. That is so interesting. Well, Jason, just to go back to your example that you shared where sometimes you will laugh even when someone might be sharing something sensitive or there's... Yep. Emotion, and I think especially if you mentioned in a you know in a partnership, personal relationship, but at work, if you are my boss, and if I shared something that was very emotional for me and you laughed, it would be very upsetting for me. Of course, and I I would expect you to be upset. I mean, I would have been upset if you were my peer, if you. But like, there's something when you then layer on that you're my boss. I think it does add to it. I I think I think it does. I, I think I believe you would be right f- to be upset with me for laughing in that situation, and I believe that that would be worse. It would be worse if I was your boss than I, if I was your peer. Like you would be right to be more upset with me mm-hmm. uh, if I was your boss. I don't think that that means it's unforgive that it should be unforgivable, like a thing that I did without unconsciously. But I but I would say I would expect to pay a relationship price mm-hmm. for for making that mistake 
and that's essentially what I think you're making this person aware of in in the mm -hmm. it, when you're giving them the feedback is that you might see it as a verbal tick or you might see it as not a big deal that you laugh, but it could be having this very real cost on how people perceive you or how people perceive what you are saying, that there's a price that you might be paying for not trying to change, to make any effort to change the yeah, behavior. Yeah, I think that that's where I wanted to kind of close on before we get to the tips, which is about one's willingness to make a change. So if you were to say to me, Amy, look, I'm your boss, but I'm still human. And something I struggle with is laughing. At inappropriate moments. Inappropriate moments. And I want to be really clear. It's something I'm working on. It's something I'm doing my best, but it might happen from time to time. And yep. so I just want I would you to say, know that. I think if it happened, I would say, I'm sorry that it happened this time. Like I, I do, I try to do better. I'm sorry yeah. that it happened. And you like, might not, maybe you don't know, or you would say like, hey, will you let me know when it happened? So I think yeah. if somebody were to say that to me, if you were specifically were to say that to me, I would have a lot more compassion and that would level the playing field from my perspective. Like they're working yeah. on it. They're doing the best they can do. Similar to Kim's interrupting. And I think that's why it's so important to start with inquiry in this case, like going back to the person who's asking for advice is like, you start by asking questions because you don't know what position the person is actually going to take, whether they're aware of it or not, whether they're willing to change it or not, even though it is frustrating to you and you are probably right, that is getting away in the way of this person's long-term success in their career, opening that conversation with inquiry, especially if you're... It, if you believe, as I think is fairly well documented, the psychological evidence is fairly strong that this is probably an unconscious behavior that this person is not fully in control of. But if you create some space for a conversation about it, starting with that as an assumption, I think you're much more likely to quickly get to a place of openness on the other person's part to at least exploring changing the behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just, it's been bottled up. It has. The whole time. So I don't know if we had as much laughs and giggles on this one as we as we might have. We certainly missed Kim, but I think we got to a good place. And let's do our checklist. Tips to start putting radical candor into practice. Tip number one, get curious, not furious. That old saw. Oh, there, there she is again. Good old curiosity. We keep bringing her back. Uh, st try to stay out of judgment. Start by asking questions. And when giving feedback, describe the impact of the issue to avoid personalizing it and offer help. So instead of saying it is annoying to me when you do this, I think focusing on it makes it hard to understand if you take seriously what you just said is a better approach. And then the question of, is there some way that I can help? Tip number two, if you are someone who struggles with nervous laughter, Psychology Today has a few tips, including things like deep breathing, otherwise known as diaphragmatic breathing, counting, which are also a form of mindfulness practice, yoga, strenuous exercise. Exercise always seems to be, uh, <laughs> be helpful. Chanting or actually repeating selective musical phrases. So you could think about this as a kind of singing meditation. And in addition to a mindfulness meditation practice, really learning about the cues that trigger this type of laughter. So knowing what might spark this behavior can help you bring some more awareness to it and create a different type of feedback loop. We'll put the link in the show notes. I'm aware that the goal of many of those tips revolve around two things. One of them is lowering the reactiveness of your mm -hmm. uh of, of like your nervous system so strenuous exercise for example mm -hmm. helps to lower the uh, stress hormones that are running through our body and the other tips are about creating focus so that we can create some space between awareness and response mm -hmm. so hopefully interrupting the the laughter which i think something tells me but if you have this and you learned to manage nervous laughter, you might learn some other very valuable life skills along the way. Tip number three, remember that the onus is on the boss to adapt to saying things in the way that it's easiest for the employee to hear them. If you want more tips, go to RadicalCandor.com slash resources, and you'll find our free learning guides, Radical Candor on Masterclass. We've got our lit video book. We've got our workplace comedy series, The Feedback Loop. 
and more. We'll put a bunch of resources for you on this episode in the show notes. That's radicalcandor.com slash podcast. As you know, we like to praise in public and private and criticize in private. So go ahead if you like it, what you hear, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And if you have criticism, please email podcast at radicalcandor.com. Should we just have a collective laugh, you know, ha ha, ha ha. I have like a really crazy <laughs> fake laugh. But I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that is that is that is the perfect way to end the show. I can say no more. Bye for now. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com.